Welcome back. This week we're looking at what I would call a meat and potato section. But just like the Transformers, there's more than meets the eye. The complete text of Article 1, Section 6 goes a little like this. The Senators and Representatives shall receive a compensation for their services to be ascertained by law and paid out of the Treasury of the United States. They shall in all cases, except treason, felony, and breach of the peace, be privileged from arrest during their attendance at the session of their respective houses, and in going to and returning from the same and for any speech or debate in either house. They shall not be questioned in any other place. No senator or representative shall, during the time for which he was elected, be appointed to any civil office under the authority of the United States, which shall have been created, or the emoluments whereof shall have been increased during such time. And no person holding any office under the United States shall be a member of either house during his continuance in office. Clause 1 the first thing that stands out to me is that the senators and representatives get paid, duh. But that's determined by law, which isn't that what they control? I wish I was directly or even indirectly in control of how much I got paid. The second thing that popped out to me was, they can't be arrested? What? But the Supreme Court has ruled that this idea of accept treason, felony, and breach of the peace line really means any criminal action. So if they commit a crime, boom, they can be arrested. But arrest from civil suits? Nada. Wait, hold the phone. People can be arrested from civil suits? Yes, I have to admit, I was today years old when I learned that. I thought civil suits were always about damages, injunctions, etc. Apparently, at the time the framers were writing the Constitution, this was a big deal. It was happening pretty regularly that someone would get arrested for a civil suit. And the framers didn't want to, you know, have a representative go in prison and be disallowed from, well, representing the people over a civil suit. So yeah, another thing worthy of note is at the time, you could also still be imprisoned for debt. It wasn't until 1833 that the federal government made such imprisonment illegal, also called debtor's prison. But you see, that was federal courts, and it took until 1983 before it was illegal for a state judge to incarcerate you over fines or fees you couldn't pay the court. You might think that they've figured it all out now and it's over and done with, but there's actually been an uptick in people going to jail and prison over bills they can't pay ever since the 1970s. From staying in jails because you can't make bail, to tax evasion imprisonment, unpaid child support getting you locked away, and courts doing this assessment where they have fines and fees you need to pay them, but they've ordered you to pay them, and you're actually going to prison not because you didn't pay the fine, but because you didn't comply with the order to pay the fine. Yeah, that's really just the same thing. But if you're a Congress member, you're free of this worry. So if you get stuck in one of these situations, just run for Congress. The last part of this first clause is pretty direct. For the stuff a representative says, they pretty much have immunity in a court of law, as long as they were performing their congressional duties at the time. This has had some pretty broad interpretations in the past, but it usually resolves to being some kind of like really real immunity. More so than most things you might know about or see on TV. This can even apply to criminal proceedings. I won't get into it, but let's just say a Congress member could probably burn someone with a waffle iron on the floor of Congress, and so long as they were voting or arguing a bill, they'd probably never go before a judge or be arrested by any sort of police over it, and even if they did, they wouldn't likely be found guilty due to all these stipulations about not being able to get evidence or testimony. This may be an exaggeration, I'm not after all a lawyer, but it doesn't sound like it. The good of this section is that they can't be arrested for stuff that could be considered intimidation by influential people or other branches of the government 
right? Because if they were to civil sue them, they could take them out of being able to vote and not being able to participate as a representative. There, there's lots of things that go into there and that's why they actually wanted this in the constitution. Clause two. This second clause is referred to as the ineligibility and incompatibility clause. It basically is saying, if you hold an office currently, you can't just go hold another federal position or a federal officer position at the same time. You have to resign at the very least. But it also protects against, say, a different position gets its salary increased and now looks far more appealing to you than the job you have, so you jump ship from that position to the other one. That can't happen. That's the incompatibility part. This is a part of the Constitution hoping to help reduce or prevent corruption. There's a lot that can happen still to work around the intent of this, but it's trying as best as it can. There are some legal arguments that have gone back and forth to determine whether military office from say being in the reserves counted and then forcing someone maybe to resign. But all in all, these ones hold up as seemingly intended, even if not perfect protection from corruption via position finagling. And that's a wrap for Article 1, Section 6. It's now under our belts and we're moving along. Thanks for taking this journey with me and see you next time. This video is brought to you by Caffeine Zombies. Coffee's so good, it'll wake the dead.